Hey folks, and welcome into another episode. I'm Dr. Luke Hobson. I'm an instructional designer for MIT. I'm also an online instructor, blogger, podcaster, and the founder of Instructional Design Institute. It's my purpose to help you make the online learning experience come alive for you and for your students. You can find all of my information about the show over at drlukehobson.com. Today's episode is all about marketing for online higher education. How is it that some institutions have grown exponentially compared to others during these times? Joining me today to discuss this is the founder and CEO of Canahoma, Seth O'Dell. Seth is the marketing machine behind institutions like UCLA, SNHU, and many more. In my mind, when I think of marketing, I think of Seth and his idea behind the SNHU bus commercial, which helps SNU grow from 7,000 students to 70,000 students. Yeah, that's not a mistake. That's how much they grew during that time frame. You are going to love this episode. Even if you aren't in marketing, there are so many amazing golden nuggets to take away from everything that Seth is going to tell us about today. This conversation was absolutely fascinating to me as Seth gives us the behind the scenes look of just how marketing works in higher education. Before we get into today's conversation, today's show is produced by Instructional Design Institute. This institute is the one-stop shop for instructional designers and higher education. As a student at the institute, you'll have the latest instructional design content, the best coaching, and of course, access to a group of learning nerds like yourself. The current courses include scenario-based learning, revising online courses, designing podcasts for courses, and the one that's going to come out later on this week is on UDL, or Universal Design for Learning. So come check out the Institute today for free by using the free trial link in the show notes below. And you can find more information over at drlukehobson.com. And that's spelled D R L U K E. H-O-B-S-O-N dot com. Let's get into today's episode, shall we? Here is the one and only Seth O'Dell. Seth, thank you so much. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. Great to be here. Absolutely. Absolutely. So normally for guests, I like to tell them to introduce themselves and go into a bit of their background. But you, my friend, have a crazy background of how you got into higher education. So I would love for you to introduce yourself and explain more about who you are. But please feel free to go into as much detail as you want to go into of how you got into higher education, because it sounds bananas. Uh, yeah, you bet. Um, so again, I'm, I'm Seth O'Dell. Uh, Currently, yeah, the CEO and founder of Canahoma, a new education marketing agency, but I've been in the space a long time. I've been in higher ed 15 years, just about, um, but my path to here was a little crazy. Um, I, I was a late bloomer, uh, my mother would say, had a lot of odd jobs. You know, I was a clubhouse manager for minor league baseball team. Uh, I ran a restaurant in Yellowstone National Park. Uh, I, I worked construction in Los Angeles and redid Dr. Phil's Kitchen. Um, I worked in TV news, running teleprompter, ripping scripts. So, uh, you know, it took me a while, um, but long and short was uh, I found my way into UCLA, uh, specifically in media relations. And that was kind of my introduction to higher ed professionally. So I, I was worked in TV news for ABC in upstate New York, moved to LA with nothing, uh, and, uh, and basically lucked out in a job at UCLA. Uh, and that job was like really fruitful. And it, I spent four years at UCLA, worked two different uh, jobs. And like it was, it was 2007, 2008, 2009, like real early, like digital era. And so I ended up becoming like the video guy, the YouTube guy, setting up their social media accounts. I was their content manager. Like I was, it was like the kitchen sink of digital marketing, you know, that like, I just said yes to everything they needed. And, um, I did four years at UCLA. Uh, then I ended up, uh, while at UCLA, I founded higher ed live, which was the industry's uh, first and only live weekly web show. So it was back in 2010, 2012, I was doing interviews like this live via Ustream. Uh, and uh, at the time, it was, you know, now everybody does it. It was, it was a little innovative at the time. I did that for two years. Uh, and in the middle of that, in 2011, is when I moved to New Hampshire, uh, where we crossed paths, you know, and I, I spent four years at Southern New Hampshire University, had three jobs, um, ended up really doing their national advertising, like the creative, like the TV commercials and all of that. And, uh, really cut my teeth in adult and online education there. It's like, uh, one of the few smart decisions I made in my life, right? It was uh, in 2011, knowing that I needed to leave a UCLA, like an R1, um, you know, 
four years in a row now, they're the number one public institution in the country. But in 2011, I left to go into adult and online education intentionally. And that was like, I made a lot of dumb decisions in my life. That was a smart one. And it, it opened up Southern New Hampshire in a great chapter. Uh, and since then, I spent two years at an OPM, an outsourced program management company in Utah, four years at National University System in San Diego, where I was vice chancellor of marketing. Uh, and I just, I've had a lot of career growth. Uh, I've been very blessed with that and very lucky. And uh, basically, it was like, you know, CMO for the past four years for one of the larger university systems in the country. Uh, and then last month, quit it all to start my own business. And so it's been a, it's been a wild run. Uh, I love higher ed. Uh, I come from a family of educators. My grandfather was a college president. Uh, my grandmother uh, started one of the country's faulted first adult advising divisions. So in the 1980s, she built like a student affairs division for working adults. You know, common now, like you know that more better than with anybody with Southern New Hampshire. Like my grandmother did that in like 1988 uh, and really built that stuff out. My, my mother was a, a junior college professor and I grew up, you know, coloring in the back of the classroom, uh, you know, after school. And so uh, it was a winding path that involved minor league baseball and national parks and construction. Um, but it's like, I feel like very blessed. I feel like I found my way home and I love higher ed and I've been here, you know, 15 years and uh, I definitely uh, feel a part of the industry and a part of the space. And I, I'm grateful for that. So that is, that is me in a nutshell. Yeah. A nutshell, just a, <laughs> <laughs> just, just a craziness in a nutshell. So I got to unpack that a little bit there. Since unpack there my so friend, many things that I, I want to <laughs> ask about. And uh, and the way I love to actually talk about all these things for these questions I have currently in my brain is that I'd love to be able to obviously ask more about your timing with UCLA, SNHU. Uh, I've been going into what 2020 has brought us for marketing and then obviously to more for uh, Canahoma and, and talk about all those different amazing yeah. things. But, but first thing that just kind of popped up as you were telling your story what did you want to be when you were growing up? What, what was the dream job? That is a great question. So there were two dream jobs. Uh, it, it shifted from elementary school to middle school uh, to high school. Actually, there's, there's, there's three. Uh, elementary school, no question. I wanted to be a garbage man. Uh, that, <laughs> that was the dream, and my yeah. mother hated it. Um, but that was it, uh, and that was the dream. Uh, middle school, it evolved. I really wanted to be a park ranger. Uh, and that's actually what kind of led to me eventually ended up in Yellowstone. I wanted to be a park ranger. And then high school, you know, I, I was a punk rocker in a band and I wanted to be a musician and that flamed out pretty fast. But, you know, so it's evolved from garbage man uh, to CMO and pretty much everything in between. <laughs> You're my kind of person, man. I had the same journey of if you can see the guitars behind me right now, I, I played in bands for forever. So I, yeah, I, I, I hear you. You know, I was kept on thinking more and more about the music scene. And eventually, as I got older, I kept on thinking and I was just like, how do I make money doing this? Yeah. You know, it was, it was just tough. If, if this is going to become a, a professional full time job, I'm like, how am I going to do this? And it was, uh, yeah, that's eventually maybe be like, mm, I'm, I should look at other jobs and try to figure out like where where my other passions are how could how do these transfer over in some way shape or form so yeah, yeah no i i definitely hear you there and what's all right so i was talking more about all the, the craziness that you were speaking about one thing i know that i've heard that you have actually mentioned before is and you kind of like talked about this a little bit too is a lot of like you were at the right place at the right time now it comes from UCLA and SNHU and all these other different organizations. And when I, I find that so funny because as we were saying beforehand, when I think about marketing and online higher education, I think of you. Because every single time that we worked together at SNHU, we would host these. And for those of you who don't know SNHU, we had just these massive town hall meetings where all these employees gather together. Then we just basically talk about updates of the organization, what we're doing, where we're going. And every single time, Seth would come up there with his team. And he was just like, here's this brand new commercial that's a super tearjerker. You're all going to cry and be so proud of our students. Every time. That's like what, what always happens. <laughs> and that, of course, led, in my, in my opinion, I feel like you contributed heavily to Snooze growth because oh, of the you. commercials you're thank talking you. about. You know, everything I can even see right now in the, the back as far as for the bus. Yeah, the, yeah. the major bus like commercial. The bus on the wall. Yep. And, and every student, whenever I was an advisor back then, I would talk to them. And they were like, is, is the bus coming to my town? And I was like, I don't know. We're probably going to notify you. I'm sure it's not just going to 
pop up randomly at your door. <laughs> but those commercials, they clearly captivated the audience. They clearly captivated their attention and made them really look at SNHU. And I, I know that with the growth during that time frame went from like 7,000 students to like 70,000, something yeah. astronomical like that. What was it about these marketing efforts and your creative ideas that really spoke to students? That's such a great question. Um, it was an awesome chapter at Southern New Hampshire. I feel so lucky. It was 2011, 2015 that I was there. You're right. The growth during my tenure was 7,000 to 70,000 students. Um, you know, the, the organization had done so much right. Like we had the right portfolio programs, uh, s expanded into some smart national advertising strategies. Like the pieces were there. And so uh, first off, like, you know, kudos to, to the people I learned from and worked with. because like so much great work was done by so many people um, already. And so I say that because like, I feel like the, one of the reasons why the work that, that I did hopefully had an impact was it was like one of the last pieces that was like missing. And, and, and the reality is the higher education industry is like really crowded. There's 4,000 plus colleges in the U.S. Uh, there's a ton of opportunity to go back to school anywhere you want. And nobody had ever heard of Southern New Hampshire. And so like we had to create marketing campaigns that would cut through the noise and people would like, you know, candidly give a shit about and um, the work, I think, if I was to distill it, Southern Hampshire, it was a couple things. Uh, the first one was that uh, after the first campaign I did there, everyone after, uh, which was, you know, I did, I think, 34, 35 commercials. After the first, the first campaign, everything used real students and real alumni. Um, and that was intentional. So my whole tenure, we always casted real students because, you know, authenticity was one of the most important things. And we really focused on celebrating student success. And like, uh, you don't have to overthink it sometimes as an advertiser. So like the delivery of uh, delivering diplomas to online students who couldn't make it to graduation, which was the theme of the 2013 bus tour. That was kind of like the catalyst, I think, for my work there during my whole chapter, because uh, it was just um, the university invested in celebrating success. It, it originated because the CEO I had asked the CEO in an intake meeting, you know, what, what was missing from the last campaign that you wish you saw? So it's like my first lesson is ask people, don't ask people like what they want, ask people what was missing. It's easier to see something that's missing than to kind of pull out of thin air what you want. And so what Steve Hodan, the CEO said, he's like, he's like, I want people to know that we, that we, I mean, he said we give a shit, but he basically, you know, I want people to know that we care. Um, and it, because really Southern New Hampshire had a, an advising culture, which I mean, you know better than anybody that really cared genuinely, like tried so hard to support students. It was so great. And Steve was like, you know, if people just knew that we really actually care this much. They'll come here because we, I don't think other people do. And so the lesson to me was that um, the problem is you can't really position on care that easily as a marketer because everybody says they care, right? Like no school's like, Hey, we're the school that doesn't care. Uh, everybody would say they do. So the lesson for me as a marketer was that uh, when what you do isn't different, how you communicate it has to be. And so for us, it was like, okay, we care. Everyone else says they care. We're going to have to show that we care in a way that no one has ever shown before. And so we're going to do something bigger and different. And that was where the idea was like, well, you know, students every year graduate after, I mean, our students and adult institutions, they're out four, five, six, 10, 20 years, they're out of school sometimes, this is a big moment. And yet if they can't make it to graduation, it just shows up in an envelope in the mail. Like that seems so small. It seems like, and so it was like, well, that's the opportunity. And so, you know, we pitched, you know, give us a large budget. We're gonna, we're gonna go rent a bus and we're gonna travel the country. And we're gonna deliver diplomas. And I can't for the life of me still believe that leadership approved it, but it just goes to show the culture that was built at Southern New Hampshire. And, um, and it was real. And so to me, it's, it's authenticity. It's, uh, you know, creating a unique position for us in market differentiation. Uh, and it was interesting. And at the end of the day, like there's a famous uh, ad guy, Bill Bernbach. He came up with like the, the uh, Avis number two campaign, the Lemon campaign, a bunch of great stuff. He talks about how like the first job of advertising is to be interesting. Because uh, if you're not interesting, no one's going to pay attention. So they're not going to hear your message. And so uh, I think we tripped into a concept that was authentic, that was honest, that was real, and it was interesting. And somewhere in that combination, I think it worked for us. And I, I don't feel very lucky. I don't think I knew, I still don't think I know that much now, but I knew very little back then. And we just got very, uh, I don't know, blessed, lucky, grateful. It just all kind of fell together. And it was a right place, right time for, for that kind of campaign. And just, it was a tip of the spear for everything that came after. 
Oh yeah, of course. And students absolutely recognize that, like, as you mentioned that, like we care, that was, yeah. that was the thing. I mean, sure enough, you know, like the way that it kind of worked is that after they saw the commercials and everything, then they wanted to go and sign up. Then it's literally me calling them, welcoming them to the school. <laughs> it's yeah. just like how that all came into play. So it was, you know, it just transitioned so well to say like, yeah, we, we really do genuinely care. It's, it's not just, you know, just, just, just giving you some random pack of lies or something like that. Yeah. Now you talk about one thing that I was going to ask about next, though I'm really glad that you said that, is that senior leadership bought into what you wanted to do with a high amount of money. And it's like, these people are crazy, but you know what? We're going to give them a shot. For those in marketing at other institutions right now who have the same vision and idea of like, I got this, I know this is going to work, but let's say that their senior leadership is not on the same page with them. What would you give them for advice as far as for how to get them um, to buy in? And and is it something along the lines of being able to be detail oriented enough with KPIs and metrics for defining success yeah. and, and things of that nature? Yeah, I mean, so there's there's a, a lot of advice in this area. Selling big ideas has been something that I've gotten to do a lot of in my career, and so I've learned a lot of lessons uh, the hard way. Uh, and so, a couple pieces. You know, the first most important thing is that. Um, you need people to need you to do the thing that you want to do, meaning that you need aligned incentives. So at Southern New Hampshire, um, it, was, it was growth. That organization wanted to grow. They saw an opportunity in market with the for-profits declining, demand for adult online ed continuing. They saw that they were better than the competition, and they saw that the competition was slow to enter the market. And the, and the organization rightfully said, well, we're going to go. We're going to grow that. And so... For me, it was first connecting, like, how can I help you grow? So like, first is if you want to sell a big idea, like a, like a big campaign for marketing, first make sure that, that what the campaign is going to produce is what your leadership wants. That's like uh, the, the cost of entry to even start the conversation. Um, beyond that, um, to me, there's a couple pieces. One is um, understanding that like selling big ideas is not about getting a yes in the room. Um, so I was told this by Lawrence Lockman, who was, uh, the, at the time, the assistant vice chancellor at UCLA, who uh, was a, my head of my division when I was there. And he's now at, at, uh, at Penn state. He said, if, if, if you're in the room and you're trying to get a yes for the first time, you're already too late. And he talked about that real pitching, real work comes before the meeting. And he's like, that means you're socializing, you're checking in, you're talking like, like if people are surprised in a pitch, you waited too long. And so that was a hard lesson. I learned that the hard way that like, I used to think that it was the merit of a good idea that you'd bring everybody in and you present this one big concept and, and my pure brilliance would just blow their hair back and they'd immediately approve it in the room. And it's like, no, that like, you know, people rightfully have fears and concerns and um, feedback and like, you need to like be humble enough to acknowledge and accept that. And so um, I guess what I'm saying is pitching is iterative uh, and you want to start soft. Uh, and so the other one is that it's not about getting to yes. This is the one that I learned with that bus tour, the one that we're talking about right now. It took me seven months to get a yes. Seven months I pitched that concept with the team that we were working with there. But here's the key. Uh, the, what that taught me was it's not about yes. It's about getting them from no to not yet. And so when we pitched that, they didn't say yes, but they also didn't say no. Leadership said not yet, essentially. They were like, well, we have concerns. How would you do that? How much would that cost? Where would you go? How do you make sure that you're state? Can we even go into all these states because of state regulation? Like, they, and, it was like, and, and what I learned was that's all you need from people. Don't fight them to get a yes. That was a great point. We'll take that as homework. We'll go find out if there's states that we can't drive through. We'll go find out how much the bus is going to cost. We're going to go find out who the students are that we would feature. And that was this iterative process over like seven months. And finally, after seven months, like three weeks before we were supposed to leave, they finally said yes. And they finally did it. Um, but it's because it's not about getting someone to say yes, but getting them from no to not yet. That's like the most important lesson in how to sell big ideas. I love it. That's amazing. Uh, it, what state could you not drive through? Uh, so I don't, I don't know if I want to mention it because we've never, okay. not been <laughs> through it. Uh, but it was to, to their credit, it was more just questionable. Um, okay. I will say we, we did avoid one state um, entirely and a couple others we kind of mostly avoided. You know, it, it, it just comes down to whether or not you trigger local presence uh, sure. in online education. And, and, and Sarah was not a really big thing back then. So uh, you, every state kind of had their own online uh, approach versus uh, right now it's much more unified. Um, so it was a gray area and we did our best to navigate it with the guidance of, uh, of legal counsel. 
Uh, fair enough. It, it blows my mind because you know I, I'm I'm still up here in New Hampshire and in New England there are such differences when it comes to driving between New Hampshire and Mass for a number of different topics and, and things too that you're just like wait what happens if i it's, it's like you know it's like oh my gosh you're going into a different country now there's all these different regulations it's like it's right it's 45 minutes away from me like it's not that yeah just yeah. wild stuff so i was like hmm, i wonder if there's anything else behind that one so, <laughs> so i'll tell you uh, the main thing was whether or not a bus was a billboard um that you can physically go wherever you want but if you are actively advertising on ground that triggers local presence and you have to have a certain level of registration and relationship with the local state and so we weren't trying to advertise but it was a really great like unanswered legal questions like well if there's a bus is that advertising it's like well we're not really trying to advertise while we drive through we're trying to go see students but that so that was this this the crux of this and i think a lot of people experience this is that you know as online education has expanded um, before Sarah became popular, which is really you know, unifying the majority of states across the country under like a shared governance model, uh, which California is still not a part of, um, but I think everybody else is at this point. Without that at the time, it was like, I mean, there was a team of lawyers trying to figure out every state and what, because you can, sometimes you weren't allowed to teach in that state. Other times you're allowed to teach in that state, but only you can't advertise. And so like one of the other areas is that when you advertise nationally, it's fine because that's called like an overlay. And so like you can buy national TV and advertise in 50 states. But you may not be able to like if you're outside of California, you can't come into California and buy a billboard unless you're you're set up with the state to teach online. Um, there it's it, there's still a little of that then, but back in 2012, 13, 14, I mean it was a it was a mess, and um, and everybody was trying to figure it out. So that was one of those challenges where like it could have been easy for leadership to say no to an idea like this, like we can't drive across the country. There's like, but instead, like this is like, honestly, I remember I went and met. I hope they don't mind me saying I met, went and met with like you know the legal counsel, and they basically said like this is this is the law. This is what we think the interpretation is. If you do this, we think it's defensible and we think it's fair, and we're not trying to skate around anything. And it, but it was still a gray area. And they're like, you know what? Like this sounds like a really good project. You should do it. And like uh, that's the difference is that even though there's always a risk with some of this stuff, um, that SNU was always the kind of place where it was like if you just put the student first and do your best, everything's going to figure itself out. And at the highest level, leadership always embodied that. Um, I guess it's like the, whatever the opposite of a fear-based culture is, that's what that place was. That place was pretty fearless. Uh, as far as, you know, as long as it was mission-driven and aligned with values, like, you know, knock your socks off, go have fun. And um, I don't know, still crazy that we got to do it. We got to do it twice. We did two cross-country bus tours, and uh, it was a blast, man. It was such a, I, that's what's like such a blessing. I, don't, I can't believe I got to do that stuff professionally. Um, you know, still, I still, people talking about it at conferences and stop and ask me questions. And, um, you know, I, my aspiration is to not be a one trick pony and hopefully I've done other work besides that. That's been great. But if, uh, if I'm always known for that, that's fine by me because it's a great organization, uh, that I was honored to be a part of. Yeah, it will, it will always be a cool thing if you're known as the bus guy. You know, it's, bus guy, <laughs> I've literally been called the bus guy. On more than Have you I really? <laughs> <laughs> yes, literally that. I could see that. I could see that. You need to put that in the resume. Like, you know, the bus guy. He's, you're, you definitely, yeah, you want to talk to me. It's. <laughs> So you talked a bit about before supply and demand of online education. That's definitely yeah. changed over the years. The um, just the awareness of it all this keeps on changing. And now in 2020, I feel like we have done the most drastic transformation of it all, which is kind of like of a you know the, the way of the world it is it kind of forced our hand to different things with online learning and remote learning. But what I found is so interesting is that you have some schools who now they're in they're in dire straits, they're closing down doors, they're doing layoffs, all these um, crazy things that are happening. And then you have other institutions who are currently thriving. I, I think about a lot of people I know and in other institutions across um, the US, and they were saying about how their summer enrollment numbers were typically summer is one of the, like, the, you know, the lowest of all of them throughout the year. It's been higher than it's ever been literally in years. Yeah. And this is, of course, due to the nature of the world. What is it, though, that those universities in particular are doing with marketing to be able to say, like, I know you're going through a real tough time right now, but hey, have you thought about your education and trying to be able to take that to the next level? What, what are they doing? So there's probably a few things. Uh, I think when you kind of look at the organizations that have found the most success, uh, the first thing I'd say is the organizations that have had success were already ready, um, uh, meaning that they, they were prepared and ready for this. You know, 
uh, the first 20 days of COVID did more to drive online education adoption than the first 20 years of the modality in our industry, right? I mean, the organizations that dra dragged their feet, that, that weren't interested, suddenly everybody was online. And I think the tough lesson was that, like, it's not about delivery. Um, it's about perfecting the entire experience and the operation that delivers it. And so the organizations that are thriving are, are I think they have a couple of characteristics. The first is they were already there and they were already doing it. I haven't seen anyone that was unsuccessful before suddenly successful. So it's kind of like that it's, you know, it was pouring gas on a fire for organizations that had already positioned themselves serving adult and online and non-traditional students across mod modalities, you know, in-person, online and hybrid. And so those organizations, especially the ones that were established well in the grad space, have found success, you know, to some extent. An economic decline is, is in theory, you know, always going to positively impact enrollment. Our industry is counter cyclical. Um, this is different than most, though, and so what we're finding is that the level of uncertainty is causing some folks not to return. Um, specifically, community colleges are down double digits across the, the country, um, and so it's not exactly the same thing as as those of us that lived through the you know 2008 to 2011 kind of uh, chapter. Um, but it's for some folks, it's similar. I think the biggest thing is organizations that were ready and efficient and well run. Um, you got to deliver a positive experience. You got to call someone within the first two minutes. You got to have an email nurture series set up. Um, you got to have a positive, you know, first course. Um, you have to have advisors ready to go to walk them through the LMS and to be available for support. Uh, you know, there's just all the little things that organizations that have been there before. I think that was a big piece of it. Uh, and because those organizations already had a brand associated with this, that as the pandemic hit and, and employment rose, uh, for the people that did decide they needed to tool up and increase their education, they went to the places they already knew. Um, and so I, I guess my assumption, and if anyone listening has heard of different, like, please reach out because I could have missed it. <laughs> I don't know of any new entrant that has won during this chapter. To me, the winners won more and the strugglers struggled more. That's kind of how I would summarize the past, you know, eight, nine months. Yeah, I can't think of anything either. And I was just wanted to ask to see if I was missing something because I, I still yeah. think of all the big names. I, I still yeah, think exactly. Of, yeah, that, that's and, and I'll read about them. And maybe there's something that one of their leaders have done in this political climate where you're like, oh, that wasn't smart. And I'm sure, I'm sure that affected marketing. Um, but I can't think of anyone else who was a no name. And all of a sudden they're like, Poof, they're the brand new. Yeah. Liberty, the brand new, you know, yeah. Snoo, something like, you know, along those lines. So marketing to online students isn't new. You've been doing this clearly for um, a long period of time. And now, though, we kind of have these students who are almost going into it, looking at it, actually, for the first time, I thinking like, oh, maybe this can work for me. So whatever you want to call them, remote learners or, or whatnot, you know, it's a totally different yeah. idea. And I've seen other organizations go and adopt new ways for their products and their services to entice people to check it out. And that could be uh, adding in a delivery feature, doing a drop off and never done before, um, even reducing steps. Like I know that I, I saw a neurologist the other day and it was nothing like I've ever done for any doctor's appointment ever. I was in and out in like three seconds. There was no, it was literally just the doctor was like, what is this is amazing like please keep this if this is a new trend for going forwards is there any trends like that that currently higher education has adopted since all, all this craziness has started to happen uh you know i would say i i think a couple things i feel from my observations that this kind of the past year has really really propelled the conversation around like decoupling to the micro credential level um, you know, so much of education is, is tied to the credit hour, which is, you know, a hundred plus year old concept um, that, that measures how well a student sits in class and doesn't measure how well they learn. Competency based education was sort of supposed to solve that. And in, in its execution of the past 10 years, uh, if I was to be, you know, reductionist about it, which I, I shouldn't, and because there's been so much great work in the space, but generally speaking, competency based works really well for students that don't necessarily need it meaning the students that, that need high touch, high engagement, the ones that need access to low cost education the most, typically require a high touch engagement that can't be delivered as easily through a competency-based model. And so um, that decoupling, I'm not sure led to dramatic success that caused us to reimagine the product. I do think the micro-credential conversation and the stackable uh, credentials and achievements is really interesting. That like rather than coming into a program and consuming the majority of the program and then getting to the concentration courses that, that you're really interested in. Can we flip that model upside down, let you take just the concentration courses first 
um, and really focus on task oriented learning outcomes and then give you a certificate. And then if you want, you can stack it into the degree. Those conversations, which I think have been propelled by this are really interesting. Um, and I think they're really important. I think the challenge from what I've observed it, with those conversations and others is that leadership is looking to innovation to solve today's problems. And unequivocally, innovation won't solve anything this year. Optimization solved this year. Optimization will save your year, being more efficient and more effective. No question innovation is needed. I think we all look at the higher education space as it exists today. It's widely geographically dispersed. The largest, SNU is now the largest university in the country. It has less than 1% market share. Like this, this industry hasn't even begun to be disrupted. Um, there's so much change coming, and I think we all welcome it, but people can't forget that that innovative, you know, a boot camp's not going to make your fall enrollment number. Uh, and, you know, uh, one new uh, course or program isn't going to. So it, I think there's been good, uh, you know, good propulsion behind some new areas of innovation that are really focused on on making the product more attractive and accessible to the market, which it should, um, and removing some of the gatekeeping components of our, like, kind of past systems. I love that. Um, that said, I think it, it, as important as they are, people need to also recognize that like they're not going to actually drive significant revenue for your organization potentially for years and years. And so like you don't you, you can't just put all your uh, your eggs in that basket. And so like, the way I've talked about it in my past was uh, you know if we're not the best at today's model, what makes us think so we can be the best at, at re you know creating tomorrow's model? And so like you have to do both. You have to be the best at today's model while you reimagine the model, which um, is you know is its own challenge. So I've seen a lot of focus on innovation, which is great. Uh, the micro credential and uh, and kind of the stackable credentials are both interesting to me on the marketing side too. That said, my final thought on that is, um, if you're a marketer in higher ed, it's important to know that it doesn't matter if you're selling five classes or an entire degree. It costs the same amount to acquire the student. And so the question is, which one of those, a full degree or five classes, can you afford? to spend three or $4,000 acquiring a student on. So as much as the new model is is what the market wants, I have yet to see someone effectively or successfully market it because it's too expensive. If it costs thousands of dollars to acquire a student, you can't sell them a program for 1500 bucks. Uh, and I don't know how you solve for that. It has anything changed as far as for with marketing to students for a full degree versus only a certificate or something of just a one-off professional development course? Has any of that changed recently? Um, I don't know that it's changed. I think the people that are doing it well have found that um, there is a higher volume of customization. People want to customize. So like if you you're looking at the history of the online MBA is a great way to look at that, right? Online MBA came in as one of the first really growth areas for online programs at this point, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, and then suddenly it became saturated. And the folks that have succeeded in, in maintaining oh. online MBAs, especially as demand for business programs has been declining, are the ones who offer specialization. So, you know, there's a lot of organizations uh, that have adult serving that have 20, 30, or even 40 MBAs. And the truth is, you know, 80% of it is the same courses. It's the same core, but you can then take a concentration that make that takes that degree and makes it more customizable. The reason that's important is because people, you're looking to find a way to make, someone's looking to find a way to make themselves as attractive as possible in their industry. So if I can get an MBA in healthcare management, that helps my career a lot better than just an MBA. And yet I don't need to have 15 courses in healthcare management. I can have a 12 course MBA with three courses in healthcare management. And you can take those same three courses and you can put that on your MS in marketing and your MS in finance. And suddenly you have a finance degree in health in healthcare management, a marketing degree in healthcare management. And what you're taking is this general education component, providing the specialization of a graduate program and then customizing it by industry. I don't know that that's new in the past year. Um, but it's definitely been the bread and butter for the past five, six years for folks that are finding ways to succeed. And the folks that are struggling are the ones that are coming out with really generic programs that don't have differentiation associated with it. Well, as an educator, that makes me happy to hear because I've been also talking to so many students where it's almost like when you think about you want to learn a brand new skill, it's always, hey, I need to go back to school for four years or for a four year. And it's just like, no. And, and what other area of your life do you feel like you need to commit 
so much time. Like there's other, <laughs> there's other ways to go about for doing these. And that's why I wanted to ask about all of the concentrations and just only taking like a course and, and that's all because everything else too keeps on popping up for uh, the Udemy's, the Skillshare's, Link Learnings, you know, all these different other platforms are capitalizing on that now. Just like we can help you with this one yeah. particular area. Well, and that's where it's so interesting. There's because there's kind of two there's two different lanes here. Is that are folks interested in in basically acquiring the competency, or do they need the ability to demonstrate the competency to someone else? And the gray area of all the ones you just listed is what is the value of those for demonstrating competency? And that's what's going to be really interesting. Is coming out of this pandemic there may be a shift in the market's response to this. I mean, when I went to, you know, Southern New Hampshire in 2011 and I left UCLA, you know, I had some academics laugh at me. Like, what are you doing leaving, you know, the, the country's number one public institution to go work for an adult online institution? I think those days are done with the pandemic shift, personally. Um, and so then the next question is like, okay, you know, I could watch some YouTube videos and I could get a competency in an area, but how do I prove that? Okay, that that might not help me professionally. It might help me execute my current job. It's going to make it hard for me to get a new job. If I go back to school for two years and get that grad degree, I definitely can demonstrate that competency professionally. But now I've sunk two years into just trying to dem like to have the competency and demonstrate it. The middle ground is is the area that's undecided. That you know everything from your Udemy to your Coursera to your master class, um, and and that to me is the unknown. I'm not yet convinced that those are as valuable as they need to be, but as they become endorsed, I think they will. And what I mean by that is uh, Google is offering certifications, you know, in, in a bunch of different fields right now, including partnering with a community college on one. And as you see these brands coming in and offering their kind of name as an endorsement, um, I see credibility in that. And so I think that the credibility has to come from somewhere. Maybe that comes from Udemy and Coursera and those platforms. You know, maybe it comes from a third party partnership. But that's the question. You know, I think no. I think no question. Though a lot of those deliveries can, like those different delivery mechanisms, can provide the competency. And so that's the first shot across the bow for our industry. So you don't need a, a four or two year degree model to deliver that competency. And then that means you may not need that cost. So the only unanswered question is: is what about like basically certifying, recognizing, and vouching for that competency? Um, that I think is slipping, but only in the early stages. I don't think it's going to change anytime soon, which is why I still think a lot of students are going to go back to school. But if or when that changes and suddenly five classes at Coursera is enough uh, for you to get a certificate and nobody needs you to have the master's degree anymore, I mean, that's the stuff where the whole industry will turn upside down completely as soon as we reach out. And I do think this pandemic is going to, going to propel that forward. How much, I guess, is probably what's unknown. And I wonder if different generations are thinking about that too, and they have their own yeah. thoughts around that. Because I know that when you take the traditional online adult learner proof, you know, there's not a, I'm, I'm, I'm a millennial, so I will represent all millennials here, that I know that when I was thinking about school, I had to go back to school for a degree, master's, like it wasn't a question. I had to do it to go and out and get a job. My parents' generation, the exact same way. Talking to Gen Z, they're like, no, 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 I got, I, I just taught myself this skill. I watched this YouTube video. I'm doing it right now. Now, you know, like, I don't need that. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. Interesting. I wonder how that's going to go with even the younger generation coming up behind them is like, are they going to put more of an emphasis on one area compared to another that we traditionally have always yeah. done? I think that's such a great point. And I think there, there's no question, no question, excuse me, it's a generational shift that, that like that's coming. So in the long run, 20, 30 years, there's no question it's going to be a total shift. Um, I think we've even seen that in higher ed marketing, like taking it back to my side of the house. You know, I'm a digital first marketer, so I'm a CM, I'm, you know, former CMO. Now I run my own agency, but former CMO that came up digital first. Like I was working in social media, you know, and content management in 2007. You know, I didn't come up through traditional stuff. I then got into traditional with Southern Hampshire doing TV spots afterwards, right? And so, like, what I looked for in the team was portfolios, demonstrations of execution. I worked at a university system previously, and I worked at an agency that were, that supported colleges. I didn't require college degrees. You know, their HR departments had their own requirements. And, you know, obviously I honored those, but I didn't, I, I didn't necessarily look at that. And so I do think that there's no question of generational shift. And maybe that's the most important thing because it, it highlights that the direction we're going is, le is most likely immovable. So it's only a debate of exactly where we'll end up and exactly how long it'll take to get there. But I don't think anyone's questioning the overall length. And so then that means that, you know, the, the traditional degree isn't going to go away. Um, 
but the demand for it may shift. And, and, you know, I think part of that is the conversation people have about workforce readiness. And you know, we've seen that on you know, the tip of the spear and that is probably like coding boot camps and, you know, the areas that are very proficiency based where you can clearly demonstrate through a portfolio, your competency, those are the areas that are changing first. Um, and, but we're also seeing it, you know, even like medical billing and coding and some areas that are, that are no longer really requiring full degrees, but are looking for some semblance of course, uh, content and competency. So, um, I mean, it's just really interesting. And, and it's interesting for me for two reasons. One, because, you know, at the end of the day, what matters is people are given the tools that they need to improve their lives and, and to the lives of those around them. That's what matters. So whatever the vehicle is to do that for your degree or a two year degree or certificate, like we should just find the best vehicle to help people you know, empower themselves to better their own lives. But as a marketer, I don't know how to market that as well. Right. Like when you're selling a high cost undergraduate online degree or a high cost online Ph.D., you know, and that degree costs forty or fifty thousand dollars. You can spend five thousand dollars to acquire a student, and when you can spend five thousand dollars to acquire a student, you can buy national TV ads, you can buy tons of digital ads. Like you can spend a lot of money in marketing. And suddenly, when the when the actual product cost gets reduced and the lifetime value of the student gets reduced, it leaves less money for you to market it. And uh, you know, the marketers that figure out how to solve this are going to be the ones that win. And and because uh, the old model is not going to work in this new space. Uh, so in my world, that's one of the most interesting parts. Is like, man, how do you put this together and build a sustainable business um, that's going to deliver value that you can actually scale? Now, do you think going off of that? Do you think that certain platforms are going to be the ones that you try to engage with the most? over others? Is it going to be something that's related as far as for how much time is spent to, you know, the actual type of a platform that you're only on it so many times a day or like any correlation with timing at all in there? Like if a, you know, Snapchat's only 30 seconds to see something, would you only yeah. be able to have a five second ad or a... <clears throat> so you know. I, yeah, maybe, I definitely think that, so there's a couple areas. One of the first lessons in marketing is if you don't, if you don't have as much money as somebody else uh, and you need to grow, uh, and you need to win. There's a couple ways you can do it. You can if you can either be where they are and be better, which means like if you're on Facebook, you better have smarter, better, higher performing Facebook ads and smarter, better performing landing page. You know, I've built my career on that. I'll be where you are and I'll be better. Uh, that's the first one. The second area is you have to be where people aren't. And so you know, it's always finding what's the new thing. So uh, you know, it was search engine optimization five to eight years ago, uh, content development. Uh, now, influencer marketing, I've seen several organizations doing that recently. So it's like, okay, one, I'm going to be where you are and I'll be better. I'm going to go where you aren't and I'm going to have success, which there are folks doing that. Uh, and then the third is, I think, realizing that marketing's marketing as paid media will be shifting. And the role that paid media plays in marketing will likely be diminished over time, meaning that you know, increasingly your organic performance and your word of mouth will be more important meaning that branding and brand building will be increasingly relevant. Um, so you, marketers, not just focusing on lead gen, but focusing on actual like, um, you know, student satisfaction and outcome and net promoter score. Uh, I personally believe that's going to become increasingly important. You know, when there's 800 online MBAs, where are you going to go? Uh, you don't go online and price compare. There's 800. So you go where your colleague, your friend, your aunt, your uncle, somebody at church went, your neighbor, and they tell you how much they love it. In my opinion, and this is coming from a guy who worked in marketing at Southern New Hampshire, that's why Mark Southern New Hampshire grew. Southern New Hampshire grew because the students loved it and it delivered on the promise we made. And so that meant that the students talked about it to their friends and family. And so even if you hadn't heard of some school called Southern New Hampshire before, if your neighbor is gushing about it at the, at the barbecue, you're going to go check them out. And you're not going to go check out 799 other adult online institutions offering you an MBA. Like, you're just going to go to the one you know, that Luke said he loved. And so to me, I mean, certainly I think like my work helped and I think the marketing plans were brilliant. They had a huge leadership team with really smart folks, but like it worked because it delivered on the promise. And so I think that marketers ability to help an organization do that is going to be really probably more of a primary focus in the future. I love the word of mouth marketing for any organization, especially when you first hear about them, like, and like, you know, about it's almost like you find out a band before anyone else. Yeah. And you're like, oh, I know about them. And then all of a sudden, of course, as the people tell the band and then before you know it, they're on MTV back when MTV was a thing that shows yeah. how my <laughs> generation right there grew up on MTV. And I was like, no, everyone knows who they are now, like, but yeah. they're my thing. Yeah. I didn't want to share them. It's the exact same way, which is a hundred percent. Yeah. yeah it, so. It's a, it's exactly that. And um, so it's the same it's been the same path, you know, it's just, uh, 
It's just we're back again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, it's crazy. So let's shift gears here because you've done all these fantastic things for all these other universities and institutions, but then you go and you start your own with Canahoma. Tell yeah. us more about the inspiration behind this. What made you want to do this and just how everything is going so far? Uh, you bet. So, so Canahoma is an education marketing agency based in San Diego. I'm the founder and CEO. I launched it, you know, at this point a month ago. I think I launched it. Let me just double check. I launched it, you know, basically a month ago today. So it's still pretty fresh. Um, you know, it's an agency focusing on the education space. So colleges, universities, K-12, ed tech. And so I just want to take the knowledge that I've learned, uh, the pro, you know, kind of the approach that I have uh, and help organizations that are looking to be successful today. Um, this has been something in the back of my brain I've always wanted to do. I've always wanted to do my own thing. Um, I thought I always wanted to be a CMO and then I became a CMO and I was for the last four years and it was wonderful and the team was great. Um, but the, you know, some opportunities just came up. I had, I had my first client land in my lap, uh, and it was just sort of like, wow, like if I can leap and do this right now, I don't. And so, you know, I'm a month in, I got three clients. I got two more starting, uh, at the beginning of next month. Um, it's, it's nascent, uh, it's early. Um, but I want to build something for myself. And, uh, so you know, I want to build it myself, I want to do it my way. And I, what I really want to do is partner with organizations um, that, that are excited for the opportunities for growth and that want to be innovative. And, um, you know, I just want to be able to make an impact. And so I'm so excited about it. Um, I'm terrified. I mean, who quits, their, <laughs> who quits their like comfortable executive job in the middle of a pandemic on the eve of a divisive election? While, by the way, my wife is pregnant. We're expecting our first child next month. Uh, and quits all that and starts uh, starts their own business. Um, but like, I really am a big believer that like sometimes you got to listen in life. And like, uh, the universe was telling me now is the time. Um, my my wife was wonderfully supportive about it. And then candidly, just so you know, I mean, the story I'll, I'll tell you is last year, um, probably because one part of the people value. Last year, my wife and I sat down to do our New Year's resolutions and our goals for the year. And my wife said, "How about we do ten year goals instead of one year goals?" And she said, where do, you, where do we want to be in 10 years? And when we stepped back and I really asked it, all my answers were like, I want to own my own business. I want to, I was like, I want to run my own agency. I want to drive a vintage truck to work. I want to wear a black t-shirt and a baseball cap. I want my dog with me. I want to make great work for organizations I believe in with people that I love. And I was like, and I want to have a house in Palm Springs and I want to have two kids and I want everybody to be healthy and I don't need to be rich, but I want life to feel rich and to be like really fulfilling. And like I mapped all this stuff out, and then my wife was like, "Okay, well then, what are we doing this year to get there?" And uh, and that was where like I feel like everything manifested. I just you know I didn't seek out my first client in the agency. I just started basically thinking about, okay, if I was going to do it, what would it look like? And you know when I'd run into somebody at a conference, I'd ask them questions like, "How are your agency partnerships going? What do you like about?" It? Like I just you know became a student of the direction I wanted my life to go. And like I swear, doors opened up, and this thing just happened. And like, I still can't believe right now that it's real. And like, I'm my own boss and I have my own company and I'm working with institutions that I love. Um, and I get to work with them and make a difference and provide value. And I get to work with my friends, like it's happening. And like, uh, it like all just happened. So, you know, more than anything, I just say that like, uh, yeah, I mean, if anybody needs a marketing support, cool, give me a holler. I'd love to chat with you. But more importantly, if everyone could do me one favor, it is that this year, don't do New Year's resolutions about what your goals are for the year. Ask yourself what your goals are for the next 10. Because I'm telling you that like totally changed my life. I was just going to say, your wife is brilliant. FYI. <laughs> right? <laughs> that, that just blew my mind. <laughs> right? Because yeah. I, I mean, literally, I have a sheet of paper. It's like, well, here, I wrote, because I'd already written my New Year's goals. And when I wrote the 10 year, I realized all the stuff I wanted to do this year wasn't mapping to the 10 year plan. And, you know, and so that, that was when the, when the agency thing came up and I, I went to my wife and I said, look, you know, one of the brands that I love that like I have like adore in higher ed has come and asked me for support. Do I do this? Uh, and it was like, well, doesn't that get us closer to the 10 year plan sooner? And it was like, well, then let's let's take the pain now. Right. Like, OK, like, yeah, it'll be risky financially. And yeah, we're having a baby right now. And like, yeah, so it'll be harder this year, but it'll it'll expedite our path to the 10 year goal. And like, that's the secret to life, man. It's like, it's like accepting and embracing short-term pain for long-term benefit. Uh, and it is like so hard uh, because it's against our nature on a day-to-day -day basis. And that planning process like really helped put it in perspective for me. Uh, and so w when we looked like that, it was like, well, it's no question. Let's take the pain this year, right? Like we'll take the hit right now. You know, we'll dip into the savings. Like we'll, it'll struggle a little bit, um, but we'll be, we'll get to the 10 year plan faster than we thought. So, um, I, I, you know, go ahead. I said, or it'll all blow up in my face, but it's okay. 
because uh, there's two types of regret, right? You can regret the way something played out because it didn't go the way you want, or you can regret not let, letting it play out at all. Uh, and I know that no matter what happens, I'm not going to regret I didn't take a swing. And so uh, I'm liberated by that, that even if this blows up in my face and it fails and I have to retreat back into a CMO job at an institution, which would be fine, um, that's okay. Um, because that, that regret's palatable. Um, the regret of never trying is not. And I love how you have the foresight too of thinking about just so you mentioned about like the 10 year goals. And I think for a lot of people in education too, they think about their current job and then they think about the next promotion. And then as you were mentioning, it doesn't line up for where you want to go or really like what the next step is after that. Because for many people who listen to this show, they're instructional designers, they're teachers, they're, you know, they're all in ed different education levels. And as you keep on working your way up through higher education, well, it becomes less and less of getting your hands dirty and doing the fun, creative, uh, nitty gritty things. Yeah. And now you're managing more projects, you're managing people, you're playing politics. It's like, yeah. do you really want to do that? Or yeah. if, if that's not for you, then, you know, figure it out now. And that's so well, that's so well said. So well said. one way I put it to somebody is, uh, when I looked at the course of my career, I realized in hindsight, I got promoted past my passion uh, and I didn't see it. Um, my passion was the Southern New Hampshire stuff. I mean, you saw that with me at the front of the town hall. I mean, in that one lane, you know, doing brand campaigns for adult online institutions. I don't know. Maybe maybe I have an ego. I'm sure I do. But like, man, I'm the best at that. Like that is a thin lane. But I'm like, I'm the guy and I love it. And I, and the reason I am is because I love it. I stay up all night. I think about it. I take notes all nonstop. You know, I have a campaign idea for SNU right now and they're not a client of mine, but I have all <laughs> this write up about it because I can't stop thinking about these kind of things. Like I love that. And then somewhere along the way, the desire for growth and for money and success and equating success to title uh, and a bank account. Um, you know, I found out that like, that like I can be effective at jobs. I think I'd like to think I was actually quite good at the last job I had. But I don't know that I loved it the way I loved other jobs before it. Um, and realizing that is important. And uh, it took me a long time to do it. Um, and it was a painful process for me. And so, um, man, it's just so true. Like, if, if you're not careful, you might move up, um, but you not, might not be getting more. You know what I mean? Right. Like, uh, like your, your total cup in life might be a little less full, not a little more full. I've heard it from way too many people that I want to be able to talk about of same thing where they're like, all of a sudden they'd be growing. They're a, you know, they're a Dean and they're like, wait a minute, I didn't want to do this. Like that, but that was <laughs> that's what I thought. Like I had yeah. to get promoted. I had to get to the next step. And then now I'm doing the day-to-day -day tasks and I'm miserable. It's like, yeah, that's a big deal. You need yeah. to figure that out right now or else you're going to be stuck in this miserable job because then you're going to go and bounce from Dean job to Dean job because that's what you know. Yep. And it's, just, it's not going to, you know, yeah. it's not going to, not going to go so well. So you clearly have an entrepreneurial spirit mindset. You've, you've done your own startup. Now you have your own agency. You clearly have literally no fear of leaving one job to the next as you've done multiple times. <laughs> so for someone who maybe they're not ready to take such a massive leap to, uh, to, to do that, what would you give for like your best piece of advice for someone who is uh, looking to go down this entrepreneurial path and they are in education? What should be the next steps that they should take? Sure. Uh, the first thing is to understand that people is the greatest resource in your life. Uh, and that, that you should collect and nurture people as much as you possibly can. Um, the best benefit I had in my career, uh, I read uh, Gary Vaynerchuk's Crush It! in 2009. It inspired me to set up Higher Ed Live, which was a, you know, a video network, kind of like this podcast. I made a list of all the people in higher ed who I admired. I invited them all on the show. Most of them said yes. Uh, many of them became good friends. I officiated one of their weddings. Like, I mean, I, I've like vacationed with another one. I'm like, these people became like real friends. Um, and, and that was like an intentional thing. It was like, I'm going to try to go to my way to like meet these people. And, and, you know, I, I don't want to say collect people, but like, you know, collect friendships that are real um, and value them. And so if you want to grow your career, the first thing to do is to like put yourself out there. Um, I'm not kidding. This is my challenge to your listeners is like people should find me on LinkedIn you know, I'm Seth Odell, O-D-E-L-L, -L, and send me a connection request and say, I heard you on the podcast and I'm taking you up on your offer to connect um, because nobody does that stuff. And it's like, it's those little things. And then it's like making a quick connection, have a conversation. I mean, you and I haven't talked since we had, you know, dinner and beers, geez, eight, six years ago, eight years ago. I don't know when, right? But like, we're in each other's networks. Like we're, we're always going to be in that network. Like we're not like going to lose that. Uh, and we have a connection and a relationship. That's the most important thing because, you know, uh, I, I just can't stress that enough. Opportunities come from that. 
Um, so that's the first thing. Second thing is like, yeah, like read a read a billion books. Like, oh my gosh, if you want books to read, I'll give you so many. Like, uh, you know, Ray Dalio's Principles is like the absolute best. Um, uh, Phil Knight's Shoe Dog is one of the most inspiring stories of founders ever. So like, consume a lot of stuff, um, meet a lot of people, uh, and then just manifest the shit out of it. Just think about it. You know, at, tell people you. Oh, that's one. Tell people you want to do it. Um, like I told people I might want to do this, and that helped me a lot. Um, tell people you want to do things, and just. Uh, I don't know. Put it all out there. Like, don't don't keep it inside until it's a perfect idea. Um, just like you know, I don't know, let this stuff just kind of marinate for a bit. Uh, when I first started thinking about like if I wanted to make Instructional Design Institute, I pretty much did exactly what you said. I literally have that same book on my shelf of Crush no It. I, I pointed to it. I don't think you saw me, but no, I, was I like, didn't. I was like, I've read that book, and you know, all the other different books you mentioned too. I, you know, so many different ones. But what I did do is that I kept on talking to more and more people, and was just like, "Does this make sense? Is this a good? Yeah. Idea? Like, tell me more about this. Like, am I completely off track here? Because like, this is my perception. But I talked to other people, and of course, I didn't just ask like random people. I talked to people within my inner circle who are all professionals in higher education. I respect all of them deeply, so it's like their opinions are what mattered to me. Unlike I know that some people are like, oh. I asked my random best friend who like does not care at all what I do for a living. And we talked about that. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, that's nah, probably not the person you want to talk to this about. So no, it's, that's absolutely fantastic advice to have that. And that, that old um, mantra is so true about like, whoever are your five closest people in the inner circle, like that's, who you're going to be like, like it's, yeah. it's so stereotypical, but like, it's true. Like, yeah. yes, you will transform into them. A hundred percent. Yeah. It's just so true. Um, yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of things. The only thing I mentioned, uh, it's only peripherally related, but it's, you know, I'll, I'll say it anyway, it's because it came to mind, is uh, is like, uh, man, take some time to self-reflect and invest in yourself. Uh, I have had a, a tough uh, journey sometimes internally, emotionally, um, you know, mental health-wise. You know, I, I went through a divorce. I moved a lot. I, you know, I, I gained a lot of weight. I lost a bunch of weight. Uh, you know, I, candidly, I drank too much at one chapter in my life. Like, um there's no, there's no investment that pays off more than the pain of self-reflection and investing in yourself. Um, so like, uh, if you want to go do that stuff, it's a tough road. So don't be shy about, you know, whatever you do, let's do jog, jog, meditate, meditate, go see a therapist, knock yourself out. Mine's been great. Um, all that stuff only helps that the better headspace you're in, um, life will kind of uh, present itself to you. Fantastic. Well, hey, let's close out on that. that we, I don't think we're going to top that one anymore. So, Seth, you already said it a few times, but where can people go to find you to learn more about your work and to learn more about Canahoma? Uh, yeah, so people can go to canahoma.com. That's K-A-N-A-H-O-M-A, -A -A, Canahoma. Uh, or just type Seth O'Dell into Google or basically any platform. I'm on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, all that stuff. So uh, you can find me basically anywhere. And I would love to connect with your listeners. Um, this your side of the house is one that I am not as deep in. So I got a lot to learn. So, uh, you know, I want to get to know instructional design, the product, the student experience, that side of things even better. So I would love to connect with some folks and learn more about uh, about what your community has going on. Hey, you've already said plenty of smart things about instructional design on this call. So I think you need to give right. yourself a little, little bit first, more credit, man. Pass the first test then. I like it. Already passed the first test. Awesome stuff. Well, thank you so much. This has been so awesome. I'm so motivated. I'm going to go do something. But of course, it's like six o'clock at night. So I don't know what I'm going to do. But hey, man, thanks so much again for coming on the show. Yeah, you bet. It's great talking to you. Thanks for having me on. Well, that was our awesome conversation. Thank you, Seth, for coming on today's show. I learned so much. I've been in higher education for almost 10 years and some of the things he said I was like oh I never thought of it like that just an absolute amazing conversation and folks I hope you're able to walk away with all those really amazing tips and pieces of advice and even that motivational spark he had at the end I was ready to run through a brick wall for Seth that he asked me to I was so fired up and then of course it was late at night and I didn't really do too much but hey I hope you're listening <laughs> earlier on during the day and you can go out make a change make an impact for what exactly you want to do you can connect with Seth over at canahoma.com and of course I'm going to include the link to that his LinkedIn, and his Twitter down below in the show notes. And if you enjoyed today's episode, give this podcast a five-star rating wherever you are listening. All ratings are really appreciated. This really helps to grow out the show. So once again, thank you for doing that. And you can check out anything else about the show and Instructional Design Institute over at drlukehobson.com. 
Until next time, my friends, stay nerdy, and I'll talk to you later.